let's talk about this film, A Disturbance in the Force. It is a documentary about the behind the scenes making of the Star Wars Holiday Special. The Star Wars Holiday Special to any Star Wars fan was the Holy Grail. It aired once in 1978. I was there. I was there as a kid in my PJs, staying up to watch what turned out to be a god awful piece of variety show entertainment from the 70s. It since disappeared and resurfaced in, in bootleg VHS tapes at conventions in the 90s when I rediscovered the Star Wars Holiday Special. And it was just as bad as I remember it. Uh, directors Steve Kozak and Jeremy Kuhn have done an unbelievable job of not just, they did two things with this documentary. One, they reminded us, they rem, through the documentary, they remind us why we all loved Star Wars to begin with. Because the movie begins with Star Wars and the creation of this movie, which was a complete surprise. Uh, they talked to people like Charles Lippincott, who was involved in the uh, marketing of the movie when they didn't understand what movie marketing was, or even like toy and merchandising deals. No, movie studios didn't see that as an, a revenue source, but George Lucas did. So the movie begins with how Star Wars was such an anomaly in the 70s and the huge success of Star Wars, and then the development of the Star Wars holiday special into this ungodly <laughs> i don't even know how to describe it's so it's just a bad variety show in an age when uh, you know tv was really a landscape of bad variety shows i watched the donnie and marie um i watched donnie and marie show which was a bad variety show and they did a whole star wars segment star wars infected you know television late night television with skits they always got star wars wrong it was awful and star wars sketches on variety shows i never even knew existed are in this special unbelievable archival footage the movie is now it, it did a yet yeah, theatrical release a few weeks ago it's now on voodoo on video on demand where i just purchased it if you're a Star Wars fan who misses loving Star Wars, and who doesn't miss loving Star Wars when you look at modern Star Wars, um, we've had all, all too many conversations about that. But let's bring on directors Steve Kozak and Jeremy Kuhn. Thank you for joining us today. Hey. Hey, hey Jeremy. Long Travis. time no see. It's been way too long, man. How yeah, you? no kidding. By the way, the, the zone of interest intros, this is about as big a pivot as you can get to this. Right. <laughs> let's talk about the Holocaust, and then let's talk about Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that look, the Empire's uh, uh, uniforms are uh, kind of inspired. Yeah, Empire did some bad things, too. So uh... Right, there you go. But, no, there's, um, Nazi, there's Nazi stuff in the holiday special. We have, I, we have people I, talk about it. Like when the Stormtroopers come to the Wookiee family, like there's some elements of that. Yeah. Right. But um, tell us, first of all, how did you guys meet up and what led to you even wanting to do this? Because I'll say this, I have copies of the holiday special. I have it on, on DVD, standard def. I've got it on, got had it VHS years ago, but um, I have so many questions. Just how did you two get together to even make this? And how did you up res the footage? I'll say the footage looks better than I've ever seen it. You must've done some AI up -resing. It looks fantastic. Yeah. Steve, Steve got a master of, uh, he can get into that. And then, yeah, I'd used, I used Topaz to up res it to uh, HD and 2K, just kind of played around with it. I did get a, I did get a master uh, from, I knew the executive producer of this who doesn't remember anything about it or he just plays like he doesn't remember anything about it because he remembers everything about the David Bowie, Bing Crosby thing he produced the year before. But he doesn't remember anything about this. Uh, he was able to get me a copy of it, and it is a, it was, it was a, it was a bump up from a two inch to a three, uh, not a bump up. It was, it was from a, it was a, it was basically digitized from a three quarter submaster that they had made off of it. So it's a pretty good quality version. But then also, and it was, it was, I guess it was like an aspect ratio issue. Jeremy, you could tell about that. But Jeremy found a clip on YouTube 
that was actually better in certain areas. So we kind of, right, you kind of jockeyed back and forth between. I mean, a little bit. I use the Zion, if you're familiar with the Zion cut, that's probably the best overall cut that's publicly available. So it's just, a lot of it was just kind of hit and miss and seeing how things worked out, but we just ultimately want to find the best version of each scene that's in the movie. Well, I'll, I'll say this. Did you, okay, so the process, this is a big thing, big story to tell. You're telling kind of the story of Star Wars and it's early Wild West days, which I yeah. love. I mean, it's even described as kind of in the movie as Wild West. Like people didn't know Star Wars was, Star Wars changed the industry. Star Wars, Jaws and Star Wars, the sort of back-to-back -back summers that those came out, changed the industry of the movies. The, that It created the blockbuster which I'll throw out a, do, a, a recommend for a podcast called Blockbuster you can find on Spotify, which is sort of an, um, uh, uh, it's almost like a doc, an audio documentary about how those movies changed the industry. So you get into that. So there's that aspect of it. You made me love Star Wars again. You really did those old days. <laughs> I remember I bought the, I bought, I got for a gift for Christmas, the early bird kit. I remember that, that there were no Star Wars toys. There were bad ones. It took like a year for them to get those out. And um, it was it was just this crazy wild west of this movie's a hit. People want to buy Star Wars stuff. Let's make it for them. And then let's make a holiday special. But also, I didn't realize, who's the guy? Why am I spacing on his name? He has the weird haircut. He, he writes for the Oscars. Oh, oh Bruce Valanche. Valanche. Bruce Valanche. Bruce Valanche, the right comedy writer. He does punch up for, he's done punch up for years on the Oscars. Bruce Valanche worked on the Star Wars holiday special and he couldn't say you got an interview with Bruce Valanche. You interviewed the writers who worked on it, the producers, the behind the scenes, the, the picture that you paint of making the holiday special should be a narrative movie. I'm sure you've already thought of that. It's already a play. Someone did a play of it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's but like where where did you begin? Did you have like an outline? Did you like okay, we're gonna do an outline first, then it's just collecting archival and then choosing who to interview. I mean, a lot of it's just starting. We had questions, so you start. I, I view it more as like journalism for like a doc, where we we have some preconceived notion of where we want to go, but we also want to be open to what people are telling us. So as people tell us what's going on, uh, that leads to other paths, and you know, it's just bit by bit we get there but you know, can i interrupt real quick you know Please. when justin mentioned when jordan meant uh god it's only been five years when jeremy mentioned uh <laughs> the journalistic part it was funny like every now and then i would talk to someone about the special and they would think i was absolutely out of my mind they would like go what do you what do you like you're doing an investigation on the star wars holiday special and you know that 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 feedback came a lot to me from certain people. It just seemed, it sounds funny now. I enjoyed the journalistic part of it. It was the craziest thing I've ever investigated. But it is funny every time I hear Jeremy say that. It 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 was a journalistic uh, you know search. Yeah, I mean the idea is you might, you need to be open in a documentary of like you might be surprised by what you find at least other stuff. Like you don't want to have the answer already and then build a movie to build to that answer. It's kind of boring. You did that. And, and Jeremy, I have to compliment you. I am in your previous documentary Raiders at which was so much fun. Look up Jeremy's yeah. other documentary Raiders. It's about the, the kids in high school who made a feature length Raiders of the lost Ark with special effects where they almost died burning down their basement using gasoline to create fire. And uh, you had me in that documentary. I appreciate that you didn't put me in this documentary because I don't know anything about the holiday special at all. Everyone that you interviewed knows so much. You even got Gilbert Gottfried um, pouring out for Gilbert yeah. and all these other people. You clearly worked on this documentary for years. The interviews, people, the, the fact that you were able to track down Bruce Valanche and people who worked on the holiday special is insane. And there's a great balance between your on-camera interviews and footage from the holiday special was amazing footage and photographs stuff that the you you did the behind the scenes story of the jefferson starship song that's in the movie <laughs> it's these stories are insane you basically created a book's worth of material with this doc i hope you do decide to put out a dvd of this with stuff that you couldn't put in it i mean it's a tight 90 minute doc where you're just like there's not a dull moment 
Um, yeah, actually, I was pulling uh, people ask about extras all the time. I started pulling extras together for the Blu-ray, and like I didn't, like, I felt it was all pretty weak. I feel like everything we like in the movie that we wanted the movies in the movie. It's the first time that's ever happened. Like Raiders, we had like hours of outtakes. Although I have to say, the Gilbert Gottfried uh, uh, interview was absolutely stupendous. It was, and I think it was about an, about forty-five minutes, fifty minutes, just about that one subject. And he was, I mean, it was just, I was, I was in pain laughing. <laughs> I actually probably screwed up. I keep asking this. I never asked Jeremy actually directly. My, my laughter, I think is in all the tracks. It probably screwed it up for some of those bites, but he was so, there was so little we could use because he was so over the top in everything he was saying. Um, he does about he does about a ten minute aristocrats type joke on the holiday special, it's <laughs> okay. which is another great documentary. Yeah. And documentary, by the way, for everyone around, documentaries are real films. It's storytelling, right, Jeremy? The good docs, yes. <clears throat> a good doc, a good a good doc should be structured the same way as a narrative film. Shouldn't be any difference. It's just 100%. harder to do. And one thing, just to like, um, I'm gonna toot your horn for a second because I've known you, I've known you almost twenty years now. It's crazy. It's I'm weird. Old. Like <laughs> almost 20 years we've known each other, but um you are the producer and editor behind uh Napoleon Dynamite, which is um I mean, you talk to people about their favorite independent films that movie always pops up. Um it did tremendous box office and um it's just something that stands on its own. It's like weird but also oddly innocent. Um just a beautiful like slice of life story of a character. And uh, I mean, I still, I go to conventions, you still see uh, vote for Pedro. You know, you see those shirts, you see people dressed as Napoleon Dynamite. Um, yeah, it's the 20th anniversary of it too in January. I think we might be doing some of it Sundance, I'm not sure. But the, uh, by, by the way, if I move to your own too, is uh, I used your film, film festival survival's guide all the way through our first Sundance. Oh, thank you. So I don't know if it's still around, but like that was my Bible for uh, slam dance and Sundance. Well, I did four editions of the book. I don't know that you, so much of that information is available on the internet now. Yeah. It's, I don't know that. And also it changes so quickly with tools like film freeway. Um, yeah. I just haven't done, I should probably do a new updated edition. Um, but just sort of like every, I have a lot of advice for, for filmmakers. People were ribbing me today. You're always giving it's like, yes. Cause I want to see, I want to see indie filmmakers yeah. succeed. By the way, we do this annual award show called award this. You will be eligible next year for award this. All right. right. And it is a, it is the indie because the spirit awards I think are just Oscars junior. They don't really, yeah. they don't really recognize the true indie movies, movies that are made for like under a million dollars. That's what we champion. And so uh, I, I'd say we're going to probably start on our list. You got, you got to, we got to be on the short list for nominees yeah. for next year. Do I have to Under submit anything or you guys take care of it? No, no, you're already okay. eligible. Okay, you're great. eligible. All you need is to be reviewed on film threat and yeah. be available to, to purchase. You need to be able to buy it. Yeah. Okay. And the review will come out in the next day or so. So yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I, my wife, I, hope, I hope it's positive. My wife, <laughs> oh, no, no, that's, I, believe it's a, I believe it's actually a 10 out of 10. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That'll wife, help with your rotten tomato score. <laughs> my but, wife is very, very nice. She's completely does not know anything about the entertainment business, which is a wonderful, wonderful attribute that she has. It's very healthy for me. But she was like, we live in Utah. She's like, oh, are you going to go to Sundance? And um, yeah, it's like, wow, this is like the last, this is the last kind of stuff that Sundance, you know, embraces. It's all that serious. It's got to be some, you know, homeless people or, you know, it's got to be some human rights thing. Trying to explain her like now this is about as you know unimportant as can be, but I think there it's a good film nonetheless. No, no, look, I lo it's a ten out of ten for me, especially as someone who <laughs> loves Star Wars and loves great pop culture docs. Like pop culture docs are my favorite type of docs. But you're right about Sundance. We could have Jeremy and I could have a whole off camera conversation about what I, I think mean, Sundance is now. I don't feel very welcome there. I mean, I know for a fact. Oh, really? I. Yeah. I mean, I haven't felt, I mean, like Napoleon was submitted today, like that. It wouldn't have got, I don't think it would get in today. Like no, that type of film. It just doesn't, it, uh, I mean, I was surprised we got in when we got in and we got into competition, but I mean, occasionally it gets stuff through, but it's just, uh, I feel like South by Southwest is kind of filling that void where it's more like 
fun pop culture. Like that's, we were really excited to have this film premiere there. Cause that's like the right audience is that crowd. Yeah. South by Southwest um, through the Alamo draft house, probably one of the greatest movie theater chains in America, yeah. which also does their own distribution for movies. Shout out to Tim league who created the Alamo draft house. They train their audiences to like stuff. That's not traditional mainstream big budget Marvel stuff. It's like they train their audiences to look for movies that are challenging or different or about pop culture. So um, yeah, yes. I, I just don't, here's what I'll say about Sundance. I don't think that festival is as important as it used to be. It's not as important as it used to be. And I don't even know that festivals, even if you never premiered a disturbance in the force at South Bay Southwest, it wouldn't have mattered. This movie's going to find its audience anyway. Yeah, so, the, the whole the whole fan community could not be more supportive and nicer about this. Like, I keep waiting for some level of like toxic fandom, but like it hasn't happened. Like, everyone's been a great cheerleader for us, and like we feel feel really thankful for it. I thought. What that was, was your experience at South by in terms of uh, yeah. its reception? And you know, no, was, it was great. Was a smart move. Uh, I guess that's ultimately the question. Yeah, I mean, it, it was it was off the charts. I mean, the main reason you go to festivals, I feel, is to build up like one it's kind of like the stamp of approval or it's like levels you above other projects but right. it also like that's where we got our first basis of reviews i think we got like 20 something reviews out of uh south by southwest which without a festival it's very hard i think to kind of uh get reviews i mean you can kind of reach out to people but that that gives you a solid base to build on that led to 12 other festivals like we paid sick guests and fantasia and uh, it's had an awesome festival run yeah well I, i'll 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 just say we could, like I say we could have an offline conversation about Sundance, but um, <laughs> you're right when you already have a audience built in. I mean, with the documentary, I don't know if you saw my doc Attack of the Doc. I did. I was I was a contributor. I was like, <laughs> oh, you got the oh, DVD. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. Oh, oh, thank you. The Kickstarter. That's right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So, I mean, I had a very I had like an outline, but I didn't know where it was going to go. I needed an outline just to have some structure. But I was like, well, we'll see what happens because I don't know why G4 went away initially. So, so thank you. Uh, thank you for being a supporter. I'm no, uh, I miss, job. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Well, I'm working on another doc. I might need your notes on. Let's there have you. an offline conversation. I have a cut of we'll, we'll dog on, sl- on Sundance and we'll talk about your project. Yes. Bit. Yes. We'll have a, like, we'll see how much. Yeah. Uh, but, but um, this doc, I was just, so it did what I believe you must've intended to do, which is I, forgot how much I love star Wars because you brought us back to the seventies and th- those, I mean, just the, the interviews and let, yes, there are celebrities and recognizable people in the film. Kevin Smith is in it. You know, Bruce Valanche, a lot of recogn- Gilbert Gottfried, a lot of recognizable faces, but also the writers and these TV, the fact that you got those and they really tell the real story. Oh my God. The, the reaction at South by had to be insane. No, it was great. It's just, it's, it's also a fun film to see with an audience. Like it's, yeah. I've had multiple people say it's like funnier than like comedies that can recall. Like we made it for people to have a good time. And I also feel there's some cathartic way. I mean, I wasn't, I was, I was born after the special, so I don't remember the seventies, but like there's something about going to a simpler time where, you know, remember what it was like in the seventies and the eighties where like we didn't have phones and the internet. And it's just kind of like you had three channels and you watched what was on. Like there's something kind of comforting. I feel about that to a lot of people and reminds us, like why we like star Wars in the early days. Like my, the first movie I've ever seen in the theaters, return of the Jedi when I was like three and a half. Wow. And I don't, I don't remember the movie. I don't remember anything that happened. I remember the feeling vividly. I remember, you know, I was, I mentioned this in the, in a, the, the last screening, which was absolutely, I think the best screening we, we ever did was the one at the Utah film fest, uh, film center. It was the audience was literally screaming at the screen. They were like, and at first I thought, wow, this is really, it's kind of rude. Like they're talking to the screen. This guy sounds kind of loud, but I'm like, no, <laughs> that's the whole thing. This is the whole thing. But um, one of the, one of the feelings I had watching when I, when I experienced the film is that I feel kind of like what you do, Chris. I like, I remember that time frame. how magical it was. I mean, I, I, I went to see it. I was dragged by friends to go see it. I, I hated science fiction. They dragged me to the theater to go see it again with them, and I it completely blew my mind. I mean, those scene, that scene, I could still remember when they went into the trench 
at the end. I mean, that was the most amazing experience. And I do sympathize that I'm not bringing in because Jeremy loves this. Jeremy's much younger than me. But I mean, to be able to experience that in a movie theater at that time, specifically at that time, you know, now you're used to sense around you're used to all this great sound in the theaters. You didn't have that at that point. It was completely a mind blowing experience. And it was just a great film as well. But I mean, that's something that doesn't really get talked about when people talk about their first theatrical experience, you know, and, and then when you see just how manic it was and how everyone was talking about that film, there's never, ever been a film, no matter how great the response was for Avatar when it came out or whatever, you know, that just, even though it became a religion in the 90s and it created this whole nother level of, of, of popularity, that first couple months in the summer, I mean, it was just insane. Just, you can't even describe it. And that's part, there, there is part of that in the film we, that we, I really like that we have that excitement from Weird Al and explaining, you know, what that mood was like you know well yeah that's that's what i think is one of my favorite parts of the movie is explaining trying to understand what the phenomenon of star wars was at that time it was so big it's um like you said steve it's completely like it, there's nothing that even compares to it you can talk about end game and the build up from marvel that was close not the same not the same. And, and that, like, I remember walking out, like what it changed star Wars. And this is not, it's a very common thing that people say star Wars changed my life. When people saw it for the first time, it changed their lives. It, um, which is why it's had such an impact, which is why I think we won't, we won't go down this road. The current star Wars is kind of a disappointment for many. Um, but in any case, uh, but I, will have, say one, I will say one thing on yeah. the, that, you know, it also was a very universal film. Like, yes, you know, everyone saw that movie that you knew. Mm -hmm. It was really unique that someone had just decided not to see that film, as opposed to so much of the niche now. The niche is just completely like there are certain people that just like I just don't like superheroes. I don't, I don't, I don't do that at all. I won't go there. There are certain people that just won't go into genres. Right, but in seventy-seven. Everyone went to see that movie. And that's, I think, part of the beauty of it was that it was just taking over. Everyone was talking about it, wherever you were. You know? Yeah, yeah. I um, made yeah. a lot of friends in elementary school when Star Wars came out because we yeah. all had something to talk about and had something in common, something we all loved. Yeah. yeah. Star Wars brought people together, which was great. We need sure. more of that. We have over 500 people watching us live on YouTube right now. We, the chat is on fire with comments and questions for both of you. Let's get to them with this uh, incredibly generous, oh my God, oh, Bush and Ryu cat for $50, uh, who's also a member. Sorry, I keep trying to save Star Wars. I saw Anthony and Gruber again, the best Harrison Ford actor who can do Han Solo in my Star Wars reboot, Star Wars Rebellion with best of the first three films in one, Star Wars Shadows of the Force using Ray Story and Luke Lives. Uh, I'd love to love Star Wars again. Uh, M, thank you for that. Very generous. For $10 from MM, Star Trek's utopia only comes after the destruction of civilization on Earth. Humanity, like any addict, has to hit rock bottom before it can get healthy. We haven't rock bottomed yet. Uh, okay, well. Um, <laughs> we got to get that. dystopian. All right, let's get to the... Uh, Matthew Hammond for 499 says, I might buy the Blu-ray for the full Gilbert Gottfried interview. We'll put it on there. You got to do it. Um, special edition. We got it. <laughs> You got to do it. A special edition Blu-ray. Uh, more questions. I mean, they're just coming in fast and furious. Just bought the film. We'll watch it this evening. Says Ledwall for two. And Ledwall, thank you. Ledwall, like, if I recommend a movie, I'm saying this is weird, different. You got to check it out. He will buy the film. I love that. Uh, Tom Siebert says, is it funny? Will I be able to convince my son <laughs> to watch this? He's so over Star Wars. It would not be a fandom watch, but if it's funny, he'll be into it, says Tom Siebert, who has a son. What are your thoughts? It's totally funny. We made it to be funny. And it's also uh, pretty clean. Like, it should be able to watch. I mean, with the exception of, like, one Wookiee erotica scene with Diane Carroll, 
it's pretty <laughs> family friendly, but that also aired on CBS in 78. So it's, it aired on TV. So, I mean, yeah, we made it for people to watch and like the whole, I will also say it's crossed over to non star Wars fans in a way that I, I don't think we expected. So if you don't like star Wars, there's still plenty for, I think for people to laugh at. It's like the We're same at- marketing campaign as Barbie. If you love Barbie, yes. you'll love this movie. If you hate Barbie, you will love this movie. That's, 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 that's what this film is. I think, and I think especially, Tom, to speak to your comment, um, if your son is over Star Wars, this is what's weird. Star Wars is not cool among kids anymore. It's it, They don't care about Star Wars anymore. You know what they care about? Skibbity toilet. Look it up. I, I was at, re, at LA Comic Con recently, and there were a bunch of kids. I took a photo every time I saw a kid dressed from skibbity toilet. It's a web series that's on YouTube that gets billions of views, not millions, billions of views all over the world. It's a phenomenon uh, amongst Gen Z. Look up skibbity toilet. Uh, Star Wars is not cool. Skibbity toilet is, but Tom, your son, it'll, it'll, it'll explain to your son why you love Star Wars to begin with and remind him when Star Wars was cool. Not so much anymore. Um, Jimmy Francis says, how old is Jeremy? He produced Napoleon Dynamite 20 years ago. Looks to be in his early 30s. Jeremy, I mean, you can, that's a personal question. Um, am I able to um, flip off the camera? Then, no. yeah. so any consolation, I was 24 when we made Napoleon Dynamite, and it's been 20 years, so if someone can do math. I, <laughs> but I, it makes you feel nice. Really a feel teenager. Yeah. <laughs> what I was doing when I was 24, I'm so embarrassed. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Laura Buckle says, I'd heard Hamill was in a car wreck before the special. They had to cover some injury. They address it in the doc. This is a part of the documentary. Yeah, we lessened. Yeah. Uh, I will say we lessened. We, so Mark Hamill's seen the film and like a big, big fan. And we, uh, yeah, so we, we had to tiptoe around that a little bit. But like he had an accident, but it has nothing to do with the special. And it happened like a year and a half. And so that whole urban myth that he's wearing a bunch of makeup because he was injured and hiding an injury. I mean, we debunk. Like we don't feel that's true. Also, if you look at his face, it's it's not different. He just he's just well, wore tons of makeup. I mean, it's, yeah, it was just bad. It was a bad. Ma- well, the other thing, like all the press he did for Star Wars in seventy seven was after that accident, and no one said uh, anything. So, like, it happened like January of seventy seven. Film comes out May of seventy seven, and all that press tour is post accident. I think so, one of the reasons we didn't get into it too is, uh, you know, we love Mark Hamill, and and um, yeah. I don't think we really had a plan about this specifically, but I know I felt very strongly that the people that make fun of him about the makeup and then go, Oh, it's because he was in that car accident. Yeah. I remember when he like broke his nose and his face had to be redone. They had to take part of his leg and put it on his head or whatever. Like people are, can be so callous about describing a near death experience that this guy had. I mean, he nonetheless, whatever is we, our point is in the film, it is definitely agreed upon that he almost died in this. Mm-hmm. And for, for people to be so nasty in the way they treat, you know, basically the guy who has carried the, 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 the torch for star Wars all these years and always done interviews and kept promoting it over the years. It's not very respectful to him. And I think we were very respectful because there were a lot of people that made some crazy comments and, you know, we definitely didn't include, you know, anyone that was, oh. that we thought it was like kind of inappropriate or whatever, but I think we handled that really well. Well, I love Mark Hamill as Luke Skywalker, but I'll say, I don't love whoever's running his Twitter account. I would advise <laughs> him to just get off social media comment here from sons and shadows. Did you have any struggles with Lucasfilm Disney over this doc? Not yet. <laughs> no, <laughs> you, you, you no, had a lawyer vet it though, right? Like I went no, through the we process. I mean, Steve does clearances. He can talk about it too. We've gone through a whole law, like legal review, E and O insurance were covered, and we actually were very conservative on what we use. Yeah. So nothing was like we're not pushing the envelope on any usage that we're doing. Right. Were well, there so- any special uh, clearance issues that you had to run, in, considering it's not readily available, and then all that old uh, variety show footage you include in it as well? Mm-hmm. Well, the variety show footage, I mean, I kind of grew up with this. My father was a producer at the time. My father pro- was one of the producers on that on that Bob Hope uh, horrific thing. He's bon- <laughs> And he'll have to atone for that <laughs> at some point. Um, 
but uh, what what I really liked what we did is, I mean, I, I will say in the shows that I've worked for, I worked at, I work at Jimmy Kimmel now. I worked at the Tonight Show. That's twenty years right there. I'm really showing my age now. But whose line is it anyway? Every every close show I've ever worked at, there's always someone pushing and thinking that they can use crazy footage without, and I'm always battling that. And so it was really nice that Jeremy. Uh, as the editor understood and, and agreed with me that, you know, a um, it's, you know, we didn't want to get in trouble, obviously that's the number one. But the other thing was, it's just so bad. There's just, we didn't put a lot of footage in it. And when you watch the film, there's not a lot of footage from the special in it. And I love that aspect of it because it's very, very tight. It's very respectful to the IP and there's really nothing that, that, I mean, Many people have said the same thing, like, wow, you really don't use a ton of footage from the film. There's nothing. We didn't use it and, and get laughs off of it. You know, we didn't because it's really not fun. It's not that funny. It's not that it's not it does not have the it's so bad. It's good aspect to it. It has the it's so bad. I'm really falling asleep through it. Well, there's a. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Jeremy. Oh, I was saying, but we, at the end of the day, we got to use everything we wanted to use in the movie. I, I mean. You always have this movie, we submit it to the lawyer for them to review. And I'm just like, oh, we're going to get like a bunch of notes. We got two notes that had something that had nothing to do with the special. There were other archival stuff that we used. Well, so it was it, nice to make the movie we wanted to make. Yeah. Um, and, and I will say, and then we took that advice. So we were very conservative on this film. This is a, a most people will get a review from a, from a, uh, from an attorney and then they'll take it as just advice. And then they'll, possibly still think oh i have e and o insurance i can i can just do whatever i want and you know we we we're very very conservative about this and i i'm really proud because i feel like i can talk about it now because i was very apprehensive to talk the discussion of fair use and so forth uh, when we were developing this. well the attorney uh for my documentary attack of the doc i used this attorney michael donaldson he wrote the fair use okay. argument that allows documentary he wrote a book about it um it changed the world of documentary filmmaking because he laid out his argument of why you should, as someone telling a story, be able to use footage within guidelines. I mean, I got notes like you got to shave. If you're going to use this, you got to cut off, cut out like eight seconds or something. You get notes like that. So we were real. Yeah. we went like a fine tooth comb through the entire film and had to make, actually it was only like three or four changes through the whole movie. Um, and it didn't really change anything that I wanted to say. So I felt really good about it. But Michael Donaldson is the attorney. Seek him out. You can Google him. Um, he wrote that argument. It changed the world of doc, doc filmmaking. We have a lot more questions here, and I know we're on limited time, so let's get to it. Uh, Kara asks, question, as I never saw the holiday special, it is a total unicorn. Is it something interesting that Disney, I find it interesting that Disney uses Wookiees and red robes as merch. Isn't that weird? Yeah. It's celebrated. There's you know, yeah. If there's a way to make money on it, they're happy to do it. Yeah. So I mean, they, they like, celebrate Life Day. Here, at the, this at, at the this park. came out. So. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I mean, I love it. Uh, like it's an author, it's an authorized like Disney product with the uh, yeah, life, it says Life I, Day on it. What I find interesting about that is not just is it a copy and a and a direct creation from adaption the way they created the action figure. There is a still in the holiday special on that art. I mean, that's very, very, that's really crossing the line even more right. in embracing the special that they don't want to think they're embracing. The Morak asks, asks, plans to release, any plans to release on Blu-ray or DVD? I'm going to do show and tell because I have this. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Wait, does it? can you buy the Blu-ray now or is that yeah, just the you prototype? Can, no, you can go on Amazon. You can buy oh. it chips in a couple days so if you go on amp if you go to our, our website's disturbance in the it has links okay. to everywhere you can buy it but you can go on amazon and buy it right now okay uh, this is a question i asked this of every filmmaker wait i got i'm going to share the website i have it here somewhere but um i think it's important just as a piece because you know what it's like to be an indie filmmaker that you just don't have like a ton of um you don't have like a huge budget say for for you know marketing so it's important that you have a link tree i think that that is something that is just really 
really important that a link tree, if you see a link tree, but this is your website, a, a disturbance in the force, you can go directly there. Uh, it, the movie is on Apple TV, Prime, Vudu, Google Play, and available also on Blu-ray. That's fantastic. So I, I, built, I built that on Wix. It took me about a couple of hours. So it's super easy to build a website now. But uh, yeah, a link tree is also yeah. very important. A, a um, super chat came in. Snakes and Funerals for Five says, you all seem to forget the true, you seem to have forgotten the true meaning of Life Day. <laughs> what is the true have meaning we? of Life Day? <laughs> yeah. Have we? I don't know. Yeah. Just be good to each other. Yeah. Be happy. Be yeah. fun. Yeah. Uh, a few more questions here. Uh, still, f there are more people that have joined. Uh, uh, 530 people watching. Patrick Lemire says, Bruce Valanche, also BFF of Carrie Fisher. They wrote jokes, banter for award shows like the Oscars together. There's a, there's a great story about that. I actually, I'll just make one quick plug. I did write a book about this that's available in bookstores right now. Same title. Um, and there's a lot of stories like this that we just couldn't fit into it. Or like this one specifically, Bruce remembered a year after we had even that we had started editing and um, he got on the phone. They, when they wanted to uh, there, well, there's this whole legend about Carrie Fisher making a negotiation to appear in the special um, when she was actually, you know, that she wanted to sing in it. So she made that her. And in the book, I definitely say that, that, that was not, that was not true. Bruce agrees. It wasn't true, but Bruce had this story about, that she wanted to sing the song River. So she came into the song, Joni Mitchell's song, uh, River. Very depressing, kind of maudlin, but a holiday song, I guess, because they're skating, which is so ridiculous. Anything with ice, like Frozen, becomes a Christmas thing. Um, in Utah, everything is snow in the, in the winter. But um, they, they were like, well, we'll never get permission to use River. So she had just sung this on the piano in the production office, and then she goes over and they they figure out Joni Mitchell's phone number and they call her on the phone, <laughs> ask her for permission while they're both on the phone like this. She's explaining that she's Princess Leia, you know, which is funny because Joni Mitchell might not have even seen Star Wars. And uh, she just like laughed and, you know, giggled and said, oh, you guys, you didn't just hung up on him. So I mean, they did try. You know, there are these little great adventures where they were they were really uh, a cute couple and 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 good friends. A uh, couple more questions here. Razor Burn, who's a member, says, "Steve or Jeremy, any plans to be creating a documentary on the making of Hardware Wars? That sounds like I mean, an opportunity." Yeah. I, I mean, I know Hardware Wars, but I don't know the story behind it as much. The what I, the one I, I know a little bit. Because okay. I know Michael Weezy. The Michael Weezy, when I was a kid wanting to get into film, Michael Weezy Publications, MWP, you can look them up, um, wrote, he wrote all these books about how to, they were very practical guides to making films. And as a goof, he made Hardware Wars, a 16 millimeter movie. It blew up. There's a whole story behind the making of it. Um, you can you can find it. I believe it's on DVD, but look up Hardware Wars. It was one of those early like movie, this is when, this is before the internet, okay? When people would just make movie parody movies like Bambi meets Godzilla. There's another one that no one else re will remember called Apocalypse Now. We would write about all these in the <laughs> early film thread. Does anyone remember Apocalypse Now? Anyways, nobody does. But um, Razor Burn, that's a great, that's a great mm -hmm. shout out there. Um, yeah, yeah, they played Doc I Wars the on Showtime in between movies. That's how I got oh, to really? it. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, the doc I want to do is uh, detours, Star Wars detours. I would love oh, yeah. to get into because it's just such a off, like no one knows anything about it. Yeah, because you talked to very Stephen little. Over. Yeah, that's good. That requires Disney's approval because they have like forty something episodes sitting in a vault that no one's seen that are completed. And it's been wow. 10, 15 See, years at this point. I saw part of an episode at a panel. I forget where it was. Might have been Star Wars Celebration or comic-con but san diego comic-con but uh yeah detours sh they shelved it when disney bought mm -hmm. yeah. star wars they had this comedy series that was george lucas approved that and made paid it was, for. and paid pay for, for it <laughs> yeah and they shelved the entire thing that was one of their awful decisions i think probably the worst decision disney ever made 
after purchasing the Star Wars franchise was to make a Star Wars sequel where Han, Luke, and Leia are not reunited in one scene. That, that decision might be one of the worst decisions in entertainment history, along with turning Disney and Marvel into girl brands, um, which I got, I got flack for when I pointed that out on social media, you know, like maybe taking a boy brand, buying it and making it a girl brand, not girls love star Wars. Women love star Wars and Marvel the way they were. You didn't need to make it. You didn't need, need to pander to women. What? Why are you? You're... No, it, we're in an interview and you're on your soapbox. Oh. I'm on my soapbox. <laughs> Jeremy, do you watch your show? You can do whatever you want. No, but Jeremy, <laughs> I know, I've known Jeremy for like, we talked about almost 20 years. Um, So he knows that I'm just like this when we hang out in real life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Jeremy was one of the common sense, sober minded people. I love to hang out at Sundance because things would happen at Sundance and I didn't need to talk to him. I would just look at him and go. <laughs> you know what i'm talking about yeah do you still come to sundance or no you... oh, yeah. my last time years. i went last time i went i think was 2019 20... 2019 uh, yeah 2019 2019 i went, I went 2020 summer. and that was my last time yeah yeah, this, Alan, be... um... yeah i've gone every year since like i was 18 so this is like my 26th or 7th sundance so you still go yeah but it's right i live in utah and it's right here and i'm kind of like at this point it's kind of like it's not that big. It's if it took more effort, I'd probably think about it. Or it was more expensive. It's, I mean, if you're coming from LA, it's really expensive being a place to stay. Right, right. No, no, no. I we look at condos. We used to we used to get a condo and have like 10, 12 people stay in there. It was chaos and it was super fun. We would see almost every movie at, both at Sundance and Slam Dance. Now it is such a chore, and I don't know that Film Thread is the most beloved outlet either amongst <laughs> film, amongst filmmakers filmmakers like oh, yeah. us because they know yeah. all, but but sundance sees no value in helping Whatever. us I, at all I, well, we had pay luca which was the short we did before so, uh, so the napoleon diamond was based on i remember driving right. in la to a p.o box to drop off a vhs set for film threat to review it oh um, man that's how oh, it wow. like <laughs> wow I think it was addressed to you I went wow. to the address to go drop it off, and it was some. It was in uh, like I can't remember what it was, but it was like a PO box. And I'm like, oh, I yeah, on Wilshire Boulevard. The same one. Yeah, <laughs> it's the same one. I've had it since '96. The same address. <laughs> um, wow, oh, that's so cool. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to. Just like I, I, I'm familiar <laughs> with Jeremy. We haven't. We literally haven't seen each other in years since um you came to my old my old place in Pasadena. It's been like, a while. Yeah, that was so the Raiders doc. That's in my old apartment in Pasadena. Yeah, yeah, you'll see. I think you film me against my you know fireplace or something no you had your you had your golden idol for like oh that's right yeah i still have the golden idol i like yeah, to collect you should yeah all right uh let's see a great last question to end on here let's do this solomon thornton who's a member asks greetings sir steve and sir jeremy what is your favorite star wars film last jedi no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> the uh it's got to be Empire. I mean, that's the that's the best of the bunch. I mean, if I was alive in seventy seven, it would probably be Star Wars. But going back on it, my favorite that I enjoy to watch is is Empire. Well, I still saw Empire before you saw it too uh, in a theater. I might I might have been one. I would have to. I say don't know Empire. if I saw it. <laughs> I'll move to Empire. Yeah. Uh, well, there you go. Hey, okay, what's your third favorite Star Wars film? Return of the Jedi. <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, Rogue one. Rogue One. All right. Okay. The fair. Mm -hmm. Fair. I just saw there was an episode where um the critical drinker who I watch on YouTube, I think he's fantastic. He he and Ben Shapiro of all people got together and ranked the Star Wars movies. They mostly agreed. They mostly agreed. What was the, what was last? Do you remember? Oh, Probably I don't remember. Like, I don't remember. All I know right? is, is like their 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 choices were not very controversial. Yeah. That's all I'll say. But um, hey, uh, I just want to thank you. I know you're on a schedule here. I want to thank you both for coming around the show. A Disturbance in the Force available on Blu-ray and DVD on Amazon. Also available on all your favorite digital platforms. Um, I, I mean, it's it's I don't know the favorite favorite pop culture documentary I've seen this year. I mean, it's like incredible. After after, after yours. But After <laughs> yours, I was going to say the second favorite one. No, I, I mean, I just, I feel like, I, I don't know. You inspired me with the Raiders. I'm like, I'm going to make, people have been saying there should be a documentary about G4. I'm just going to make it. Like no one else 
yeah. is going to tell that story from a fan perspective. So I appreciate it. And Jeremy, always great. Uh, we'll have an offline conversation after this. I'll pop you an email later today. But okay. um, thank you so much. We showed the trailer actually earlier this week. Got a big reaction from everybody. Really loved the trailer. It's fantastic. It's well, we thanks for, thanks for all the support. We were actually like the 20th highest film on uh on Apple, which is insane for a little little documentary. <laughs> wow, that is amazing. Uh congratulations, Jeremy Steve on the movie. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Take care. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks.